I'd say we all have the purpose to love the world. The problem is we've created the world out of things we don't love. But that's what quantum physics proved. We're given this manual, right? That this is the way it works. This is what we should do. Try to like supersede time. We're also focused on time. But I feel like when you get into the now, it's like timeless. But what happens is we pick one superposition out of all these gazillion superpositions, and then we live in that superposition. We're all connected. So one of my roles in life is to counteract the busyness, the complexities that other people have. We think that there's all these problems and that we need to fix them. And as long as we're focusing on fixing things, we're going to continue to have things to fix. So I thought this time, you know, we did the backstory the last time. Um, and I thought, and, and we led up to the Course in Miracles experiment. And I thought this time could do more. I could ask you more about your, your life now, uh, which I'm super curious about. I did a deep dive into your blog posts and um, I'd love to ask you about some of those concepts that you write about. And also just, you know, people out there who, may be interested in writing and traveling and blogging and all the things that you're known for. Um, I just wanted to kind of double click on some of that and just see what your experiences are. Cause you're someone who I really admire as a quote, spiritual person, but you're very relatable. You're not like walking around, you know, on this pedestal higher than thou type of thing. You kind of, you present yourself at least as someone who's like right there with us and we just kind of have a, a more, uh, simplified understanding of some of these otherwise very complicated concepts. And so I want to just kind of, you know, talk to you about some of those concepts and some of the, some of the things you've written about. And, but before we get into all of that, for those listeners who have not heard your backstory. I always like for people who come back, I always like for them to kind of give us a synopsis of um, how, how do you describe your story? If you had to like even do it in a, in a minute or two, how would you, how would you kind of give us a snapshot of who you are and what you do? Yeah. Well, I haven't been asked that question for a long <laughs> time. You know, um, I always have identified as a writer, as an adventurer. As someone who's really trying to live in the moment and really responding to life however it is at this moment. So I don't really put myself in a lot of categories, but I've always felt closest to my spirituality through my writing. That's always been my avenue. And so I will always continue to write. You know, some people are like, oh, what are you going to do when you retire? It's like, why would I ever retire? You know, it's like, I love to write. It's my, it's kind of how I figure out what I think about things often. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm a writer. And I love, it's a real compliment that you said, you know, that I seem relatable because I am real people. I don't see myself as a guru. I don't try to market myself in any way. I'm just somebody who's kind of having an ongoing conversation with friends. And as I often say, you know, this conversation about possibility is the most important conversation we can have. It's we could put our, you know, our attention more on, not on what has been, what's been in the past, but what is possible. So anyway, I'm just somebody having an ongoing conversation. And I'm very grateful that you're somebody that you've been in on that conversation with from time to time. And because I'm sure it'll come up, can you just tell us who, who is Taz and what is 222? Oh my goodness, Taz was my daughter, is still my daughter. I still feel very connected to her. And I started a 222 Foundation, which was a kind of a secret joke we had between us um, after she passed in 2018, very unexpectedly. It was one week after her 25th birthday, and she had a cerebral aneurysm and just, boom, was gone like that. And it was such a huge shock. I mean, almost as much of a huge shock as it was when I first was pregnant with her, you know? So, um, 
she's definitely played a huge part in my life and still does to this day. And in fact, a lot of what I focus on now is the 222 Foundation and, you know, the projects that we're working on um, more than, um, you know, trying to pitch a new book or a new project or something like that. Although I, you know, continue to write to my uh, fans on my website, I don't necessarily, I'm really not selling anything. You know, I'm mostly wanting to give. And that's sort of the mission of the 222 Foundation is to change the consciousness of the world. And not even trying to change it, but just to celebrate the beauty, the possibility, all the amazing things that are happening in the world. I love it. So another part, so you do a lot of, you, you have 20 books, you have, you do travel writing, you're a prolific blogger, and it's not like, you know, a 250 word blog. We're talking, some of these posts are like 800, maybe a thousand words or more, and you're all up in the comments. So it's not like you're just posting and then going about your day. You're also responding to people you have, you refer to certain commenters by first name as if you, you know, you have an ongoing um, relationship or friendship with some of these people. They've been with you for a long time. And a lot of your work is informed by A Course in Miracles. So I wanted, I wanted to hear how you um, summarize A Course in Miracles and what are some of the main tenets of A Course in Miracles? Well, yeah, my most recent book, which was really, I guess, four years ago now, but it was called The Course in Miracles Experiment, only because experiment seems to work for my publisher. That's like that, that, that being in there. But The Course in Miracles is a way of rewiring your mind, not your brain so much, but your mind, your, your connection to the bigger mind. And um, so they call it mind training. But I think a lot of people, when they hear the word mind, they think of their brain. And, you know, there's a lot of work out there about neuroplasticity and all that. But it's really like surpassing the brain and going to the higher mind. You know, the truth, the connection, the love that we all are at our core. You know, we're so busy sometimes up in our head that we forget this truth that though we really are, you know, this inner light that we all have, this inner joy, this inner peace. And we've forgotten it. So The Course in Miracles is sort of a way of reminding us of what's really true. So, you know, my book is just a series of, well, it's, it's sort of taking the, um, okay, The Course in Miracles has three sections. And one of the sections is the workbook, which is where you actually work to rewire your mind. And so what I did is I started um, blogging about my own journey with Course in Miracles one year, in fact, it was 2018. And uh, people started saying, oh, wow, this is really great. I always wondered what the Course in Miracles went, meant. So they urged me to turn it into a book, which I did. And um, so anyway, that's, that's it. But I've been studying the Course in Miracles or interested in the Course in Miracles for, oh, I don't know, before Taz was even born. I kind of measure everything like BT and then AT after Taz or whatever. But like I said, she's still with me. But anyway, I was studying Course in Miracles or studying, reading it, whatever, for 30 years, I guess. Yeah, I, I, you know, I haven't read it from cover to cover, but it's a very dense reading. And I've also read a lot of other, quote, spiritual books, which some of which I connected with more. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why A Course in Miracles? Why did you connect so much with that one that you dedicated your blog and you know, books to talking about this, as opposed to any other, you know, you talked about Florence Shin in one of your um, blog posts, you know, the game of life, as opposed to any other sort of spiritual teaching. Well, I like to think of myself as spiritually promiscuous <laughs> because I am, I'm, I've tried all kinds of different things. But the course, I don't know, for some reason, it just kept coming back to me and it felt like my you know, my thing, even though, I mean, my goodness, I've done tapping, I've done, I've listened to Abraham Hicks. I mean, I've done all the things. I mean, you name it. And yeah, when you think about it, it's such a dense, and I'm, I'm into more fun and lightness and joy. So the Course in Miracles does promise joy. It does say that's our natural state. But why I chose to get involved in deep spiritual book 
I suppose has more to do with, I mean, only, only the universe knows because I don't know if, if somebody would have said to me, here's your choices, you know, like 10 choices. Um, this really thick book that's like a doorstop, you know, or, you know, something like for Florence Scovel Shin, who I love too, I probably would have chosen the lighter one, but maybe I just wanted to keep going with it. Maybe why I chose Course in Miracles. It really wasn't a conscious decision. It was more that it just happened to be that way. And it talks about all the things, you know, that we create our reality. In fact, it says that we constantly our thoughts cannot be diminished in any way we don't even recognize how powerful our thoughts are and that everything we see in the world really is a reflection of our thoughts our beliefs our consciousness and unfortunately we've gotten way off base to this truth this light this um you know this inner thing that we're all connected to so anyway that's kind of i guess what well, i went to the course in miracles yeah, and, and, and you wrote in a blog post called uh, Make My Way for Miracles, one of your more recent posts. You said, the course tells us that if miracles aren't happening on a daily basis, something has gone wrong. So what is a miracle in, in, in the course of miracles? How do they define that? And um, can you just say more about why uh, something has gone wrong if we don't see these miracles? I'd say a miracle is when a change in consciousness happens. Like, you, you know, you forgive someone for something and suddenly you're back together. So it's like, or, or back, you know, in good graces with each other. So, and, but forgiveness in the course is different than what we think of as forgiveness. It's about whatever you think happened didn't really happen. That so much of what we believe is true is an illusion. So um, a miracle is being restored to truth, which, I, like I said, that inner joy that we all have, that inner peace. And so the miracle is when we're restored to that. I also love talking about, you know, the big flashy miracles. And certainly my book, E Squared, was filled with that. And I've gotten, you know, literally millions of stories from people that use that to get miracle. And I do love those, too. But the true miracle is just a change in the way we look at the world, a change in possibility. I often talk about going from problem state, which is what we tend to live in, to possibility state, where literally anything, everything could happen. And most of us don't believe that. You know, oh, no, what's gonna, what happened yesterday is what's going to happen today. I mean, we all expect that. We create our lives that way. I mean, I believe that if we could let go of all that, I mean, we could have peace on earth like that if we could just all let go of this baggage these beliefs that we have and people might think i'm crazy but i i'm not going to let go of that i'm going to continue to be crazy you know and believe in that possibility yeah we we actually connected uh when i read after i read e squared and i went through all of the experiments and then i posted something on youtube and i forget exactly how we connected but i love that book so much it's one of my favorite books in the world um because what you did there was you gave people the uh, ability to prove to themselves that your beliefs create your reality. And it was, it's so, you know, important, I think, for people to see this for themselves as opposed to just reading it in a book or just understanding a principle. And you said in that same blog post I, I just referenced earlier that there's not a lot left in your that's not possible box, right? So what is left in your that's so loopy? Well, you know, things come up from time to time. And, you know, that's what, it's not a course in miracle. It's a course in miracles. As in, you know, maybe today I have a thought that this couldn't be possible, so you know, you, you say, Holy Spirit, help me see this differently, or, you know, universal source, field of infinite potentiality, whatever you want to call it, help me see this differently. So miracles are happening ongoing. So if there is something that comes into my that's impossible box, then I know what to do with it. I know to ask for help in seeing it differently. So, but, you know, I've just seen so many incredible things happen. And again, getting all these stories from speakers of E squared and E cubed and my other books, it's like, how could I, how could I not believe that anything is possible? So anyway, yes, I just, I mean, I already believed it before I wrote the books, but now, you know, 10 years in, it's like, I've gotten so many stories. I, 
I couldn't even begin to not believe. In another post uh, called Joan of Arc, the Joan of Arc post, you wrote that over and over, I'm instructed that my purpose is to love the world. And um, again, for those people who don't know your story as intimately as, as maybe I have because I've studied it, how do you receive this instruction? And do you feel that everyone has a purpose? Yes, I, I'd say we all have the purpose to love the world. The problem is we've created the world out of things we don't love. We've created the world out of things we think are wrong. You know, we, we think we, that there's all these problems and that we need to fix them. And as long as we're focusing on fixing things, we're going to continue to have things to fix. We have to start celebrating the beauty. I mean, it is just incredible if you take time to just look at your life and just look at your day and look at what surrounds you. Um, it's, but, but most of us don't, you know, we're glued to our phones work. We're focusing on, you know, some problem that the world has or we're having or something that shouldn't be this way. But when we stop to really look and really live in the moment and see what's there, that, that's what we do. And it changes the energetic vibration. Like I really believe that I can sit here in my little home and radiate this goodness and the celebration and it changes the energy field out there in the world. And a lot of people would poo-poo that and say, well, how can that be, you know? But that's what quantum physics proved. You know, we don't have to physically touch the thing to make it happen. We can do it in this I don't know. It's beyond us. You know, they, they talk about um, that what we see is only 3% of what's there in the universe. 3%. So 97% we can't even see. You know, they call it dark energy or dark matter. But that's where all the miracles, all the possibilities lie. But what happens is we pick one superposition out of all these gazillion superpositions, and then we live in that superposition. And how do you receive the instruction? Do you have a meditation practice that you do? Is it about writing? Is it about reflecting? Again, spiritually promiscuous. <laughs> I think I, I definitely meditate and have meditated in different forms from time to time. In fact, I've read your book. I've done some of your meditations. Um, my thing now. What's your current meditation practice like? What'd you do today or your okay. Right now. And I love this so much. I go outside. I look at the sun. I talk to the trees. I feel this incredible connection to nature. And it feels like if I start my day in that way, and I feel it's important to start your day in the way you want it to go. Because, you know, if you get up too late and you don't do that, you know, it's quick for the need for miracles comes up quickly. But, um... So I go out there, I hug trees. I lately I've been making these mandalas, you know, where I pick up different flower petals that have come down in my yard. And it puts me so present with, with what's there. And it, with this beauty that I probably walk by every day. I mean, these are fallen petals and, you know, every day it's different ones. And so every day I make a different mandala and it has truly connected me to the bigger thing in a way that you know, sitting in meditation saying "Om" or whatever. I mean, I'm sure I will do that again. And I'm sure that, um, again, like I said, I, I'm different all the time. I, I try not to get stuck into any kind of rest. I feel like if you do the same thing over and over again, I mean, I think that works for some people. I think for me, I need to kind of mix it up because my mind can get into, a, again, a little bit of a rut and I want to keep it exciting and adventurous. So that's my current form of meditation. I go out and I do yoga. I do some sun salutations. I make my mandala. I talk to the trees. I just celebrate. Oh, my gosh. How did I get so lucky to be here, you know, breathing this, watching the sun come up today? How long does it usually last, your, your ritual? Oh, wow. It can be like probably today, 30 minutes, maybe. Um yeah, I'd say roughly that, but I don't time it necessarily. I try to like supersede time, you know. We're also focused on time 
But I feel like when you get into the now, it's like kind of timeless. So I don't know, maybe I was out there two seconds. Maybe I was out there two hours. No, I would say it's probably about 30 minutes. It probably what I did this morning, for example. And I often will take a picture of my mandala. Sometimes it blows away before I can even grab my phone to take a picture. But it's like, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's the, the point of observing and being there with nature that makes it important. And, and you know, because we are all part of nature and we're connected to nature. And I think we've sort of forgotten that. And it's like, I want to be connected to my natural state and I'm a part of nature just like everything and everybody else is. So it feels like just a good way of getting in touch with my natural state, the, na the nature of who I really am at my core. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. Yeah, I think if if uh, if, if someone who was observing my life um, didn't know what I did for a living and they just kind of watched on silent, you just watched the, the closed caption camera of me going about my day. They may think, oh, this guy just kind of works all the time. You know, like I definitely have my meditation stuff and I walk and I go to the gym and I make food and all the things, but I spend a lot of time writing, creating content, uh, creating things for social media, and it doesn't look that exciting, right? Uh, compared to what people may think someone who's done the things that I've done would, would be spending their time doing. And I'm sure you, you get the same thing. What would we see on the closed caption camera if we were to just kind of watch Pam through an average day where she's not traveling, she's not on a road trip? What would that look like? You know, I, I love what you just said. And I think that's so true. The excitement that we get doesn't have to be from some riveting experience, you know, something that you would see on television. I get such a thrill out of writing, out of connecting with my readers, out of thinking about interesting things. So it sounds like a similar experience to you. I mean, you know, what's the definition of fun? I mean, we all have different definitions. I mean, to me, I, I have fun. My goal is to have fun no matter what I'm doing, you know, whether I'm, you know, doing a yoga pose outside or whether I'm shopping at the grocery store. But, you know, everything can be interesting and fun if we decide that it can be. But I suppose I would never be chosen to be on a reality show as far as an exciting life. Now, I certainly have moments of that. Like I, I just came back from England and I had a couple of weeks of incredible, amazing things happening. But like my daily just here, really, there's not much to look at and much to see. So, but I, I couldn't be happier. I mean, I really couldn't be happier. So, you know, that's the, it's the inner landscape that I'm, I'm interested in. How much time do you spend like writing or at your desk or engaging with your readers? Like how many about? Oh, many? it varies. It varies. You know, I wrote that book, Art and Soul Reloaded, about the importance of routine and, and importance of showing up so the muses will be there for you. But when I'm not on a project, and in fact, I would say I'm just, I don't know, I'm just not as interested in um, marketing things and material things. I'm more interested in ideas. So I'm not, I don't write something every single day. Well, I do write in my journal every day. I do consult with the higher forces every day, but I don't always write something for someone else. You know, it's more for me. And how much time, like if I'm on a project with a deadline, you know, I never work more than three or four hours, but when I'm just, uh, you know, just do it for myself. It, it really varies. I mean, I love it when I get captured by the thing I'm writing and I, you know, suddenly like six hours have passed. But, but basically, if I'm on a schedule, I'm trying to do something, I'd say three or four hours a day at the most. I have a pretty leisure life. In fact, one of the things I used to say is that my life, really my whole life, I've had such a really a leisure life, an easy life, that I'm here to kind of counteract people that are just super, super busy. You know what I mean? Like we're all connected. So my 
my one of my roles in life is to counteract the busyness, the complexities that other people seem to engage in. You know, you've written 20 something books and there are people out there who have been telling themselves, I want to write a book, but they also tell themselves I'm too busy to sit down and write a book. And obviously somebody may look at you and go, oh, you know, white privilege and this and that kind of privilege. And, but at the end of the day, isn't it really just about making the time to sit down for those one or two hours or even for that 30 minutes and be consistent and just put something on paper and to overcome your imposter syndrome and to not overthink what you wrote and to keep doing it? I mean, that's been my experience is that, you know, it's hard. It doesn't, it's not easy just because you may have resources or just because you may even have time on your hands. You still have to overcome your own distractions, your own tendency to procrastinate, your own tendency to turn on Netflix, to check Instagram, you know? So there's like so many distractions, potential distractions. And yeah, I, I, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. When you hear, when you hear people say stuff like, I, I want to write a book or they, they convince themselves that it's not possible to write a book. What's the real formula for, in your, in your uh, understanding of getting any major project underway, whether it's a book, a podcast or whatever people may be telling themselves they want to do, but they just, they aren't doing it. Well, what you said is great wisdom light because it's really a matter of just showing up and starting. And the first hurdle you have to get over is the judgment you have, because when you start anything, be it a book, a, pod, a podcast, whatever it is, it probably is going to suck in the beach. And, but as you get better and better at it and as you stick with it. So I really believe in these higher forces, what in the art world they might call muses. Again, field of infinite potentiality for me squared, God, whatever you want to call it. I believe very strongly that these forces are wanting to interact with us. And so we have to, you know, commit to showing up day after day. And we have to get over that thing of thinking, oh my God, this is horrible. Because we all think that everybody, in fact, in my book, Art and Soul Reloaded, it, you know, it's 52 weeks of things you can do to kind of get into your creative mojo. But I, every one of those 52 weeks, I had a story in there about a creator, someone we know, like Steven Spielberg, um, I don't know, all kinds of famous people and how they also believed something about themselves that they weren't good enough. And the thing about it is, no matter how many projects they have, it still comes up. Like I said, I practice the Course in Miracles. I still have those voices, even though I've written 20 books, you know, so... It's, it's just part of the thing. And that's where Course in Miracles comes in. Do you believe the story that your ego's telling, telling you? I mean, I like to say, well, what does that have to do with me? You know, this story about, oh, I can't do that. Or, you know, this isn't possible for me. What does that have to do with me? And the me I'm talking about is the real me. The me that is connected, that is, you know, part of everything that's, that's the me that I want to be in touch with. And so any of those voices that go through your head, you can't pay attention to them. You just have to laugh at them. Yeah. Steven Spielberg, uh, Steven Pressfield calls it the resistance. And, uh, he's, he... I love his book. I absolutely love his book. Yes. Yeah. I really, I like to read that every time I feel that resistance or I find myself, uh, self-sabotaging quits. You know, I've written 20 books, I've written four books, but I'm still just right there, you know, um, distracted. Yeah, we all do it. I mean, Maya Angelou said, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, look how famous she is and look at what she did. And she still said up until always that she, the same voices append to her no matter what. So, yeah, that's funny because I do read Stephen Pressfield's book pretty often myself. I mean, I haven't read it now for a little while, but I do love it. And it's such a great, great book. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, he right there says that it's not us writing this, really. It's this bigger thing. And as a servant to the bigger thing, or that's like, I want to see myself that way. I want to get the message out about possibility. I'm committed to spreading light and love and joy. So, you know, that's that's what I've got to do. I've got to show up and channel of um, whatever that the bigger thing wants to say through me i'm here is that what you meant 
in Art and Soul Reloaded when you, you said one of your favorite lines was, the only book that will ever change your life is the one you write yourself. Yes, I love that because, again, I write often to figure out what I think. Um, so, you know, we're all looking to other people's books and we're looking to this guru or that guru and this might be the program that's going to change my life. I mean, ultimately, the only thing that will change your life is yourself, is your connection with the bigger thing. And I think as long as we keep looking for the next book, the next guru, the next meditation practice, the next whatever it is, I mean, we are just, we love to try new things. And believe me, like I said, I tried it all. But in the end, it comes back to me versus me, you know, me, me connecting with my higher power, my bigger thing. And that's, that's the only thing that really is going to ever get the job done. So to speak or get the connection going. Yeah. And again, somebody listening to this conversation, you know, at this point may be thinking to themselves, well, that's not real life. This is not the real world that they're talking about muses and energy fields and intel higher intelligence. You've wrote, a, you've written a response to that recently in a book. Oh, I have. Yeah. You said, who told you the real world got it right? What if the real world... Exactly, exactly, yes. Talk a little bit more. Well, if we all believe that, we have so many things that we believe. You know, we're given this manual, right? That this is the way it works. This is what we should do. I mean, you know, so we can't even hear the guidance or feel the guidance because we're so busy following the rules, following the manual. And it's all picked up real subtly from our family, from our culture, um, but it's not the truth. I mean, I like when you go back to kids, I mean, kids, they know they can create anything. I mean, they're not, they don't wake up in the morning and think, oh, it's too early or whatever it is that we adults think. I mean, they're just, hey, what's going to happen today? I mean, they're full of life. They're excited. You know, and I probably around the time you become five or six, you start picking up those rules. But I think as a young child, you're just, you're busy doing it, man. You are uh, loving it and you're creating and you're having fun and it doesn't occur to you to care what you're wearing or, or what you're eating or, you know, you're just like, okay, what's the next adventure? What's the next thing I can do? So to me, the best thing any of us can do is to, you know, become like a child. I think didn't Jesus say that in the Bible, you know, become as a small child. So before the manual gets in, in, you know, loaded up into our brain. Right. And then, and then when you really scratch the surface of all these rules that we're following, it turns out some person, usually some guy, you know, a few hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, came up with it because it served their purposes or their interests. So everything is made up. There's nothing that's like inherent in us as, as humans. So it's well worth that experiment, I think, of questioning some of these rules. Right. Well, I think we just, the, 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 most, the most devious ones are the ones that we just take without even questioning. You know, we just assume, well, that's the way it is. You know, that's the real world. I mean, like I said, who told us the real world got it right? I mean, the real world, as we can see by looking at headlines, doesn't have it right doesn't uh you know things don't look if you just look at that don't look like things are going right but underneath it all there's something bigger going on and that's that's where i put my attention i think when people say that what they're really referring to and they you you, you know this is a this is indeed i think it's it's a part of everyone's daily experiences you need money and in order to provide for yourself and for your family, and so the real world includes any income producing activities that will help you to be able to do that. And it's interesting, Pam, I had an insight um, recently where I was thinking, you know, we've all heard money doesn't make you happy. Every, everyone's heard that, but yet we still prioritize income producing activities as though they're going to lead to some state of happiness. And I thought to myself, maybe that's not what is happening. Maybe subconsciously people are working towards that because being able to provide offers a little bit more certainty in their life. 
And that's what they're ultimately looking for is, is, you know, in an uncertain world where we may not think there are a lot of possibilities, if you can't afford those possibilities, then if I can ensure that I can buy whatever it is that I want, then I never have to be uncomfortable in that way. I never have to want for anything or, or have someone that I deeply care about want for anything. And I think there's some merit to that thinking, but you wrote a book, Think and Grow Rich, which kind of gives a, a spiritual take on how to manifest or create abundance. And I was hoping maybe you could offer something more to, to us. Well, there's a lot of myths that we believe around money. And in that book, They Can Go Rich, I did talk about that. And I talked about other kinds of capital, um, which are really more important and more rewarding. And often, if you're particularly employing your creative capital, money could come to you. Um, but it's not, the, it's not the priority, but that is so much a part of our culture, the whole money thing. And I think it it causes us to do a lot of things that we don't really want to do because we think that we need to have this job, we need to have this security. But in the end, do we have any security, really? I mean, we don't. It's just a fool's errand, and we think we can get security, and that's the story we're told. Get the money, and then you'll have security. But, I mean, there's plenty of happy billionaires, but there's a heck of a lot of unhappy billionaires as well. It, in fact, in that book, I say that my goal is to be the uh, Warren Buffett of happiness. You know, I want to be, you know, that's the kind of capital that I'm more interested in because the other is just not really where it's at. I mean, yes, we want some kind of security, but what does that get us, really? It, it keeps us from going on adventures because, I mean, if you really want security, you wouldn't walk out your door, right? Because you never know what could happen. So. Um, Security is not all it's cracked up to be, but it's so ingrained. It's baked into everything that we do, everything that we think, this whole money thing, particularly in the West, you know, particularly in our country. In fact, I think our country, the U.S., well, you're in Mexico, but, you know, you're American too. That is like, it's, it's our number one myth, our number one story. So, but I think it's... um I think it's time to rewrite that story. And, you know, there's a lot of myths about money, but hey, well, like, for example, money doesn't grow on trees. Well, when you look at it, money, actually, you know, it's made out trees. of paper. It actually grows on trees. So, yeah, it's, it's all a matter of what we believe, but there's a lot of myths that we've bought into around money. But the biggest one is that somehow it will make us happier, that it will make us secure. That, that isn't the case. Yeah, you wrote that. Um, you read a lot of books, obviously, and and uh, Think and Grow Rich was excellent. E squared, E cubed, et cetera, et cetera. You said that that every book that you've written has sort of come to you from something outside of yourself, and this is something that I I struggle with, Pam. You know, I meditate every day. I meditate twice a day. In fact, this morning I was meditating. And this, um, you know, I post a quote card, a quote to Instagram every day. And this quote started coming through my meditation. And normally I don't interrupt my meditation for anything, but it was just coming through so hard that I decided to, to pause the meditation, write it down so I didn't forget it, and then go back to the meditation. And I get ideas all the time. And maybe it's, it's a byproduct of the cumulative effect of you know, a 25 plus year long meditation practice along with other things, walking and being in nature, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel like one of my problems and, and um, I'm not saying this to be relatable to anyone, but maybe, I don't know. I have too many ideas. I have too many good ideas. The muse is like, give this guy everything. And it's like, I don't have time to do everything. So how do I, how do I figure out what, what, which, which one of these wonderful creative ideas I should be doing or, um, and what do I do with the rest of it? That's funny you say that. And I, I've said the same thing myself. I have way too many ideas. In fact, right now I've got sort of three book ideas that I'm playing around with. And in my case, and what I'm doing with these three ideas is 
spending a little bit of time on each one, you know, just kind of seeing what comes out. And, you know, there's plenty of time. I mean, I could write one first and another one second, you know, so it doesn't really matter, but putting that pressure on ourselves. But um, I would say just spend a little time with each of those ideas and good for you for stopping your meditation and writing that down. Because I think as you meditate, as you connect, those ideas are going to flow. I mean, you've proven yourself willing to be a, you know, a vessel for for the bigger thing. And so, of course, it's going to be feeding you stuff, you know. And um, so, you know, I don't know how many you're talking, 20,000, but maybe that's a lot to look at every day. But, you know, pick the ones that are the most interesting to you. Like, what was your idea today? Or maybe you don't have to share. Well, it's funny. The idea today that I wrote down um, was, it was just a, it was literally just a, a quote. I have so many, I have like this, this, notes in my my phone these are all like ideas and fragments of ideas that come through so i can't even remember exactly which one but it wasn't ready for public thing yet when i when i came out of meditation and revisited it about an hour later i was like oh no this this needs more uh cooking this needs more and <laughs> just put it back in the oven but you know a lot as you know that's how it works um this idea may be ready a six month from now. It could be the beginning, the first line of the next book. You never know where it's going to fall into place. But uh, I, I also have a few different book ideas and they're kind of all over the place. Like one is a relationship book that I'm really interested in. And then another one is um, something that's completely different, just about transformation. And then another one is about meditation, even though I said I was never going to write any more meditation books. But it's funny because you see that the market rewards doing different iterations of the same things that have been successful before, but the muse doesn't give a shit about that. The muse is like, no, you got to write about this now. This is your next thing. And you've kind of, I think, been toggling with this too, with travel writing and then writing about The Course of Miracles and then writing about, you know, being an artist and and maybe in your in your consciousness, all of it connects somewhere and you can kind of tie it all together. But I know for some people, it could be a little bit confusing. Well, I know the marketing forces that are out there that we, again, big part of that myth, that story that we've all bought into, want you to repeat the same old thing. But the, the muses, the field of infinite potentiality wants to bring in new ideas, brand new ideas. And you know, the marketplace may not be that eager to hear it, may not want to do it. But if I'm willing to listen and to bring it in, that's the only thing that really matters. Um, but there's so many forces, that whole marketing, how do we market this? I mean, that's, you try to sell a book, as you know, that's the first thing. You have to have a little section on how are we going to market this or who's my audience is. You know, that's like, do you, do you play the game with your public affairs at this point? You're a best-selling author, or do you just say, look, I'm just going to do what I, what I normally do? Well, the last book, which was the Course in Miracles book, yeah, I mean, I just sent a quick little thing to them. Um, but I've been sort of interested in maybe doing a self-publishing, self-publishing a project just out of curiosity. I mean, I, back in the beginning days, I did self-publish a couple books. And I'm thinking that might be kind of fun. So I'm that's excited. I'm going I'm self publishing thinking. from here on out. I mean, it doesn't make sense yeah. really to go well, to the publisher anymore. You just don't have any no. control. You're doing all the marketing anyway. So it's like we're what? exactly. They do not market anything at all. So it's totally up to you. So why not take this? The, is the self published? Yes, this is the self published version of Blue Wall. I just got it. I got the rights back because. They ran out of stock on the printed version, and it didn't make economic sense for them to print another 20,000 copies based on whatever the sales numbers were. So contractually, they had to give me the rights back for the, for the, the physical copy. So I was so excited to get this. I got to design a cover that I liked, and I got to design a trim size. that I, I mean, it's just like I've, I've gone through the process. If people knew how... how not difficult it is to self-publish. I think more people would be doing that. Exactly. Yeah. What you said is so true. Like um, the last book that I had, you know, I didn't like the cover. I didn't like the title, the title I wanted. So it's, 
I, I don't know why not do it myself. And all the tools are out there, you know, with Amazon. There's just so many ways to self-publish. But when I first self-published my book, Jumpstart Your Metabolism, that ended up Simon & Schuster eventually bought it. But back then, there was no Amazon. <laughs> I mean, I literally had to hire a fulfillment house. I had to hire a printer. I had my mother edit it. I mean, you know, it's like, oh, you know, it was just so difficult back in those days. But I was determined. I mean, I, I wanted to do it. Taz was little. I needed to make a living. You know, I, I was on it. So, so I was able to do it. But now, I mean, you can probably just send in a file and I don't know. It's just exactly. So it's just sending in a PDF file. They do it on demand. So you don't have to sit up in your living room with a bunch of boxes full of your books. And it's super, right. super simple. And when is the last time anybody went to an actual bookstore to buy a book? I mean, I'm sure some people do. I still <laughs> love bookstores. <laughs> but you're right. It's not how people typically buy books. In fact, I find so many people like listening to audio books. I mean, I, you know, people, oh, I've been in places before. Like I was in um, in Stockholm, Sweden, and I was talking someone that, I don't know, a store clerk or whatever. So I just, are you Pam Grout? I mean, it's like my voice. They heard my voice. They recognized my voice, but that was kind of trippy. But um, so, yeah, a lot of people do that. But um, yeah, it's it's just so easy. And that's that's what I want to do next because I think it'll be fun. I mean, you know, as creators, we like to create things, right? So it's one thing to write, but it's also an interesting exercise to create how it's going to look on the page, to create a cover to, you know, come up with interesting ways to market. And as you pointed out, publishers do not market, period, anymore. I mean, maybe if you're Stephen King, they do. But, you know, that it's, it's up to us. It's up to us. And, you know, that can be fun. Can you take us behind the scenes a bit on your blog? Just, again, for people who may be thinking of writing a blog or, they're, or they are writing a blog and they're struggling and they think they're the only ones. Like, what's your process like? How often... I tried to see if there was a pattern to your posting. It looks like you don't post necessarily every Tuesday or whatever. You kind of do it. No. Um, occasionally. No pattern. I'm not a pattern person. But I, I love my blog. In fact, I pay to take all ads off of it. I pay. I pay the, you know, to not have to have ads on it because I want it to be purely my gift to the world. So I see blogs a little bit differently. A lot of people will say, hey, how much would, you know, you charge us to run a guest post, whatever. Every now and then I've done a guest post because I loved it and I thought it would be fun, but I haven't done that for years, but I, I have done that. Not at all because I want to make money. So I don't see it as a vehicle for making money. In fact, I'm not sure. Like I said, I just see my blog as a conversation with, uh, with friends, <laughs> basically. And I just happen to have friends all over the world. So that, that makes it kind of nice. Um. But as far as the process, eventually some idea will pop up and, you know, it's, it wants to be written. You know, it's like, oh, OK. Like the, the one I posted today that obviously nobody can see now because it's putting out my website down at the moment. But it just came to me and I wrote it like in 30 minutes. So it's almost like a little tapping on the shoulder. Like, you know, you mentioned that idea that came to you. I mean, maybe if you'd have paid it a little more attention, it might have developed into a full um, blown blog. But I heard a comment that made me think, what was the comment? Oh, I don't even remember now what it was, but it, it inspired me to start thinking about that. And then, you know, this blog comes popping out that I wrote. So I did try to probably do once a week, but like I was in England for a couple of weeks. I don't think I wrote a blog post while I was there. For a while, I was, uh, you know, doing this two-way thing and I was writing, I don't know, three or four blog posts a week. It, it totally varies. If consistency, no. I'm not consistent in any way about much of anything. What are your rules? So that's whatever what are the your rules, rules of engagement for yourself? Like, is there a certain length that you're kind of aiming for? You think to yourself, this is too long. I need to cut it down. Do you, when do you go into the comments? Is it just at late at night when you're, you know, not able to get to sleep or feel <laughs> like, let me open up the blog and start responding to people's comments. Well, I don't always respond. Sometimes I don't respond at all, but sometimes I feel inspired and I've got a free minute and it's like, oh, that was a nice comment. So I'll, I'll, I'll write on it, you know, or I'll comment on it. But th I don't always do that. Um, and it's so easy to just pop off a comment. It's not like it's a whole lot of work to do that. And, uh, oh, it just makes me feel good to have all these people that, you know, that, 
feel like I am part of their family, you know, and I feel like they're part of my family. And, you know, I talk a lot about possibility posses, and I've got a couple here in my hometown that I get together and we have the kind of conversations that you and I are having that, you know, I think are important conversations. But I also think of my, um, my blog community as a possibility posse as well. And I love hearing for that from them and I love hearing their comments. So, uh, yeah. So as far as length, I think you asked me about that. It just, well, it feels done now. I, someone told me one time that 300 words is all you need to do. So I usually try to do at least 300 words, but I think before I've just put on things like maybe a video that I liked or something. I don't know. I, I don't have any hard and fast rules. If that's why I'm not necessarily the best podcast guest <laughs> Is because, you know, people want to mine someone for their, this is how you do it. And I don't have any post rules for myself or for anybody else. And I feel like, you know, people think having the rules and all that is a very sort of masculine approach. And oh, for, yeah. for the feminine approach, it's a lot more free flowing. Let me just kind of feel it out. And if I feel like kind of doing it, then I'll do it. If not, then I'll, I won't, or I'll do it this way. And, and I think that that's something that the world probably needs a little bit more of is because I think a lot of people will stop themselves because they won't think that, oh, I can just feel this out. I have to commit to a certain number and I have to become David Goggins of, of blogging. And, and it's just not, you know, it's not, it's not sustainable. If you've never really had that approach with things before, you may have to kind of ease in to it and get the relationship going, you have to start dating the muse first. And then when the, and then when the muse, you know, <laughs> sees that you're showing up on a more regular basis, the muse will start feeding you the content and you don't really have to even figure out what to write because you'll start to, you'll start to be able to feel the, the, the frequency of the idea and you'll know, okay, this is something I need to, to pay attention to. Yeah, that's exactly how I would describe my process, exactly like that. And one thing, you know, you might have a kernel of an idea. And then when I sit down and, you know, I have a little file, a word pre or a word file that I just will write a blog in before I put it onto, onto my blog. And um, I'll start writing. And then one thing leads to another, to another. But so I may just have a kernel of an idea, but it feels like, you know, that idea says to me, I need to be out there. I need to be expressed. So would you be willing to do it? And I feel like, if I say to the idea, and I, of course, sometimes I do, is like, no, I'm busy today. I'm flying to wherever. Then it'll go to somebody else to do it. In fact, you know that idea you got today? Like, that was, that was yours. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I've seen a video yeah. with Ryan Holiday. He's kind of revealing his note card system when he's writing a book. And then Pressfield talks about the writing the outline on the legal pad. And that's how he starts a book. What's your process like? Or you said you had three ideas that you're considering. What, what have you done with those ideas at this point? Well, I've got a file for each one of them. One of them has a lot of pages in it. One of, you know, so it, they all, so, you know, I'll just get out one of those files and kind of look at it and it, you know, brings me to something else. I, I think I've kind of zeroed it on the one that I, I'm going to do next, the one I'm going to self-publish. It, it's just so interesting. Like this one thing I've been working on now five days straight, you know, I've written a few words. And the first thing, again, is to give yourself permission to write, as Anne Lamott says, shitty first drafts. You know, if you have any kind of expectation about it needs to be this or that, you're going to, you know, shut, shut yourself down right away. So just play with it. And then the next day, and then eventually, as you just keep going to it and, you know, massaging and paying attention to it. It's like you said, you're wooing the, wooing the nooses. It starts to flow and it starts to take shape. And it's this mysterious process and I can't explain it. I mean, there's certainly books about how to do an outline and how to do chapters and how to do all that, but that's not my process. And I like my process for me, it works because I just trust that it's all gonna come together. And it's fun to watch too, like, wow. Who, did, who knew that it was going to lead to this and it was going to lead to that? It's like, I'm just as eager as the reader sitting there on the edge of my seat, like, wait, well, hey, what's going to happen? What's going to happen next? Or what's going to come back next? It's fun. I've got a couple of personal questions or questions about just your regular life outside of writing and all of that. 
because again, you're someone who I admire, someone whose work I respect, even though I've never met you in person, I have no idea what it's like to actually know you as a friend, right? And to be able to hang out with Pam Grout, but this, this, so that's where my questions are coming from. Let's say you and I were hanging out Pam, and you felt like, you know, lights kind of, you know, he's, he gets it. He's kind of into the possibilities thing and universe and spirits and muses. How do you like to offer feedback? If you notice someone who's sort of getting in their own way and, um, and you feel like they would, they would be receptive to it. Literally, I'm asking like, what would you say? How would you, how would you, or would you not say anything? And I'm curious, how would you offer feedback to someone who you felt was going to be a little bit uh, less receptive to it? Like what's your, what's the Pam Grout mode of, of offering unsolicited feedback? Well, interesting question. I never, I don't believe in um, focusing on any negative things. So I think some people, when they ask for feedback, they want to get this thing to change or that thing to change. For me, it's more about finding that kernel of perfection or that kernel of beauty, that kernel of something that's really great and really praising that somehow or really talking about that and getting them, the person I might be talking to, as excited about that as I am listening to it. So I'm just not all, in fact, you know, the, as I've been in writers groups over the years and, you know, they're the kind where they give feedback and you go and you read your stuff and people can get really nasty. And I think that can just put the muses back in the closet. I think it's really important to be encouraging. And Lawrence Block told this story once he wrote this book called Right for Your Life. I mentioned it in East Weird, but he said that um, there was this person that sent him this piece of work that was so crappy. And he thought, there is no way this is ever going to get published. I mean, he really didn't like it, but I don't know if he said anything to the person. But he said this person was consistent and didn't want to stop and just kept writing, kept writing. And eventually this person wrote this masterpiece, maybe a little strong, but wrote something that was really beautiful. So a lot of it is just that consistency. So I don't find like it's my place to be an editor or a critic. I feel like my job always is to be a cheerleader. That's me. I am a cheerleader. Rah, rah, rah. You did it. You showed up at the page. That's the only important thing. That's it. That's it. Because I so trust that the page, the muses, the whatever thing will be there for you if you if you show up. So that to me is the only thing that matters. So no, I'm not. I'm not one that's going to give a lot of feedback or my feedback is, yes, I love it. I mean, I love to, to love things. I mean, I'm always loving things. So hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Oh. But what about? I'm, I'm really, what about interpersonal relationships? Like the person you're in a relationship with or someone who's really close to you and maybe they say something or they do something that is, again, getting, it's going against what the, the, the connection, they're invalidating your experience in some way. How do you, how do you handle those kinds of situations as someone who knows all of these laws and knows you should focus on the positives and be complimentary and all of that? Are you able to kind of stand in that in those moments or? Or how do you deal with well, I can be reactive sometimes with my partner. I, well, just like the other day, I, I don't know, something happened that I can't even remember what it was. Now. Isn't it funny how you don't even but, remember? It's like so small, you don't even remember like, it. Right. But I, you know, I was mad about something, whatever it was. And so I started thinking, you know, this energy is not creating what I want in this relationship. You know, I want us to love each other and to be kind to each other. But I, I was, well, so I became aware of it in myself. So I went to my notebook and I wrote about, you know, what was I believing? What was making me think this? And so it was really interesting. And I was quickly able to get it down on paper. That's one thing, you know, writing is really good. Like when thoughts are spinning in your head, if you write it down, then you've stopped it somehow and then you can deal with it. So, um, and then I, you know, I apologized. I actually, I think I read what I had written. 
<laughs> you know, it's like, hey, this isn't creating the thing that I want. You know, what do I really want is, you know, peace and happiness in our relationship. So me getting all bent out of shape, I'm trying to remember what, it, I mean, I literally don't even remember, but I think the way I dealt with it was the perfect way because now I don't remember because I could still be fuming about that. I think it was this weekend. And it's, what, today's Tuesday. I mean, I could still be fuming about it, but hey, it's, I don't even remember what it was now. So, so anyway, I think um, mostly, I guess I address within myself, what is it that would cause me to be upset by this? Not, oh, he shouldn't have done this or what's wrong with him. It's more, what is it within me that is causing this disturbance, this, you know, unhappiness, you know, so that's kind of how I want to deal with it. I'm not saying I always do, but that is, that's the goal. And eventually I always get to that. And really it's like progress, not perfection. It's like, you know, I would get out of it much quicker than I used to, you know, it used to be, oh, I'd hang on this, this thing I'm mad about for a longer time. And now it's just like, well, why waste another even 15 minutes being upset about that. So the quicker I can address it. Don't always do that, but that's that's my goal. It sounds like it's key to me is is getting to a point, and I know this can take a long time, get to the point where no matter what happens, and obviously this is not if you're in an abusive relationship and blah, 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 but just if you're in a normal, healthy relationship with occasional disputes, getting to the point where you can, you can own at least your end of the experience and take responsibility as opposed to continuing to project it onto them. Because, you know, you hear these like personal transformation classes, these weekend workshops where you have to forgive people and call them up and say, I forgive you for, for not giving me an, it's like, they have no idea what you're talking about because of their period, they were just doing the best they can. And, and, you know, and you start to see, oh, actually everybody's having their own experience. So, so a dispute that could come up between partners could be just something you're experiencing and they have no, especially, you know, guys can be so clueless. Sometimes we have no idea that we said something or did something that, that triggered the other person. And when they bring that energy, it can be very sort of off-putting because it's, and I guess it can happen on the other way as well. But when you bring that energy to your partner and they don't know why or or what's going on, it can, it can be very invalidating to their experience. So I think a very spiritually mature way to deal with it is what you described, which is, let me start by just owning my own experience. And then I can sort of coach myself through this. And if I need help, I'm more likely to get help if I approach it as, hey, this is, this is something I'm creating, you know, based on whatever happened in my past or whatever. And I would love for you to support me in, in this healing process. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Oh, I love that. That's so beautiful. I feel like every time something like this happens, it's almost like, oh, this is exciting. <laughs> you know, I'm I off center. I feel mad. I feel bad. So it's a way to look into my own self. I mean, one of the lines I've said in blogs and books was that, you know, if you look in the mirror and notice your eyeliner is messed up, you don't try to fix it on the mirror. You know, you have to fix it on yourself. And that's really how it is in the world. So whenever it's like, wow, this is a new opportunity to find something within myself, some disturbance within myself. It's always about what I'm thinking and believing. It has nothing to do with reality. It has to do with what I'm thinking and believing. And I've gotten out of being grateful because for the most part, I'm just so grateful to my guy. I mean, he is just I mean, honestly, I can't even believe how amazing he is most of the time. But every now and then I forget. And, um, and, and so mostly I get, I'm mad at myself, like for thinking this. So, you know, again, I have to kind of fix it within myself. But it's always, if, if looked at properly, it can always be an opportunity and something to be excited about. Wow, look, I'm off base here. Something, something could use a miracle. And, and uh, when is it like to travel with Pam? I know you're an avid traveler, you love road trips with all of your heart, you say, um, if, if we went on a road trip together, are you the type that likes to go to the tour stuff? Do you just like to go to the local cafes? Or do you have a plan? Do you flaneur and play it by, by ear? What's, what's your travel style like? That's so funny you ask that because I was just thinking I would write an article maybe about that because, okay, so when I was in England with my sisters, who I was in England with, and we were there for two weeks together, 
And every day she's like, oh, let's figure out this to do. And I'm like, well, yeah, we could do that, but something better might come up. <laughs> something, and she loves to plan and all that. And because I'm not one that's going to resist her planning, that's okay too. But we were just so struck by how every perfect thing happened when you don't get it too filled up. Like if you have a day, I mean, even in just a regular day in a regular life, if you have all these things planned, the incredible stranger that's coming to you or, you know, the incredible interaction that could happen or something, you would maybe miss it because you've got this other thing planned. So with traveling, I really like to, Taz and I used to say, let's follow our nose. And, and that's the way, and she's kind of who taught me that, you know. It's fun to know that you're going to go see a show. Like in London, we were going to go see a show. We saw the show 222, which was pretty amazing that happened to be there in the first place, you know. But um, so rather than going into London all the time, we just were walking along the Thames and these amazing things would happen. And so it really, to me, is the way to travel. And I feel like it's the way to live life because miracles, you're leaving room for miracles. You know, if you plan everything, the miracles have no space to get through. And I think maybe my sister kind of is starting to appreciate this a little bit more because, I mean, she's like, wow, this, this all worked out really well. So I guess that's more how I like to do things. But on the other hand, you know, I go on travel press trips, you know, where everything is pretty much planned. And I can enjoy that, too. You know, then you're, you know, eating at the restaurants that your host thinks is the best restaurant. You're staying in places, seeing the things that they believe are the most interesting to, you know, other travelers. So that's fun, too. I was going to ask, but I, when it's just me is Pam Grout a foodie and like, what's like, if you go to a new place, what are some of the things that you want to experience? Like, are you interested? I love going to great restaurants. I love, um, yeah, finding new foods to eat. Yeah. So that's a real important part of my travel experience. Like my sister and in some ways our perfect day, we, we walked, you know, we, We'd walk like sometimes, you know, 12 miles a day. And then we would just have this amazing dinner. And even in England, you know, it's not known for its great food, but we had just these incredible meals. So, uh, yes, I love a really good meal. I like having a glass of wine. It's just you find so many cool things. Like one of the things I've been doing this year um, is my partner and I have been going on these little road trips and, you know, we went up to Iowa and we found this amazing hotel, the Hotel Patti, that was so cool. So it's like you just find cool things. And it's like one thing after, the, you know, you meet interesting people, these great experiences happen. So I really do like to leave room. I like, you know, I have a little bit of planning. Oh, we we're talking about food and I love a, a really good meal. Um, you know, having a glass of wine, um, you know, so yeah. I, I enjoy that a lot. I like meeting people. Um, it's fun to kind of meet the locals. Where's the weirdest place you've ever been recognized? Oh, wow. Well, that story I told you about when I was in Stockholm and someone recognized me from my voice, that was pretty odd. Um, I mean, maybe I look like me too, and that's why they, you know, decided to <laughs> ask if it was me. Let's see. Well, one time, I don't know, I was, th this was pretty amazing to me. I was in Kenya and um, we were in Nairobi at the airport and I was with a group of travel riders. I think there were three of us, four of us on this press trip. And I'm sitting there waiting for my flight. And we're all kind of hanging out. We'd had this amazing time in Kenya. And one of my friends says, hey, guess what? Your book is here in the airport bookshop. Like, <laughs> I mean, that was kind of a big shock. I mean, I'm in Kenya. And I know my book, I mean, I can tell from, you know, the stats on my blog that people, you know, read me from all over the place. And of course, that book, that E squared was translated into 40 some languages. So, I mean, I know that it's out there, but that, it's always kind of a shock. It always surprises me when people recognize me or they think I'm something, you know, I'm just a little on me. I don't, so it does, it kind of surprised me. Do you follow your stats much? Like your blogs? Do you see how many readers? No, you know, how many I videos, really how many don't. shares and all this kind of stuff? No, no. I have very little interest in that. You know, so many opportunities for someone that is into marketing, they could have done so much with my platform if, if someone was into that. But because I'm not into that, I didn't, you know, I didn't make hay, I suppose you could say, with, you know, that all those people that are reading my blog. I could have really, you know, done something with that, could have sold all kinds of things. But that's not, that's not what I'm after. I'm just after 
sharing and having a good time. So, um, so I don't follow that much at all. In fact, my sister and I were talking about, you know, investments and things like that. And she every day looks to see how her investments are doing and stuff like that. I'm like, I have no idea. Although before I was going to meet her, I went ahead and looked up some stuff. I thought, okay, because Becky will ask me if she want to talk about it. But I just don't pay attention to that stuff. I guess I trust the universe so much that I'll be taken care of, that things are going to work out, that I don't have to fret about all that. So, so yeah, I mean, I could probably market and do all kinds of things if I wanted to. It's just not my area. Do you have a team? Do you have like, is there an executive assistant who's out there fielding uh, emails and making travel arrangements for you? Or are you the one? Or you're doing you, this? Well, no, I never wanted that. I know a lot of my friends, I, one of my gurus, my possibility process is spiritual entrepreneurs. And all of them have their assistants and all that, but I kind of like to keep it close and do it myself. And again, I'm not trying to, you know, be huge or anything like that so it's pretty easy to do like i mentioned you know this woman offered to this web designer from um bucharest you know offered to do my my website and i was like okay sure i let her do it but now like today when it's not working i have no control over it anymore so i kind of like you know having control over it myself so Maybe, maybe I'm not a good share. I don't like to play with or don't like to share my toys. I don't know, but I do like to share my ideas, but I don't know that I, so I just do it all myself. I think this is very helpful because again, there are people out there who have excused themselves from following those nudgings and urges of the muse because they don't have an assistant, because, you know, they have other responsibilities, et cetera. And, you know, you're, you're living proof that it is possible to do all the things that someone like you was doing and to continue to stay loyal to, um, you called it the, um, the distinct thought pattern of, uh, I guess your heart, um, as opposed to that ego voice that's telling you, Hey, I don't, you don't have time for this. This is not realistic. Uh, and just continuing to point things out that are reasons why you shouldn't do something. So. I guess to wrap it up, let's talk a little bit about that. Those those competing voices vying for our attention at all times, and steadily in the background. Some people call them the de devil and the angel, um, or the ego and the spirit, or the heart voice and the hater voice. Uh, what's your what's your uh, relationship like with that heart voice, and how do you turn the volume up on it so that? it can overpower the other voice that's telling you you're not enough, you don't have enough time, you know, and just get back to the status quo. Well, in the parlance of Course in, Mir parlance of Course in Miracles, it's the ego versus the, um, you know, the tr your true nature. So when that, the voice of the ego is the, either the one that'll tell you that you can't do this, that you're no good. I mean, that's the voice of the ego. And... I think one of the things that's important for me is to try to keep, like I said, I start out my day in, in a real peaceful place and I try to get the momentum going in a way, not that those voices aren't still going to come up because they do, but if I start the day by connecting to spirit, to the bigger thing, then the day tends to go a whole lot better. Um, but certainly those voices still are out there. I mean, that's why meditation and what you teach is so important because if we can quiet those voices, because they're always trying to raise their hand in the back of the classroom, I mean, they're always going to be there. I mean, I don't know. I think some people maybe wake up totally, like maybe an Eckhart Tolle or Robert Katie, and they don't have those voices anymore. But I think most of us, or at least my experience is it's taken me, I'm, I'm not, you know, doing the sudden leap to enlightenment or awakening. So it's just a matter of um, paying more attention to what I want to celebrate, paying more attention to the good stuff. Same way I don't want to, if someone wants feedback, I'm not going to give negative feedback. I'm going to try to mine out the thing that is working. And there's always something working. So the more you can shine your light on that and the less on that ego voice, you know, the better off, happier you will be. And being happy and staying, you know, keeping my frequency happy and uplifted is, is important to me. I mean, that's a really key thing that, you know, makes life work for me.
What's next for you? I know you said you're self-publishing something. Is that the next thing? Or do you have a workshop coming up? Because you do those on occasion or uh, another travel blog, travel writing gig. What's what's coming up? Um, well, I'm going to Colorado next week. <laughs> as far as, you know, just my personal life. Um, I, I'm working on this book. Like I said, I five days I've been there doing it. And it's starting to come together in a way. So I, I, I'll probably continue to work on that. Um, uh, in September, oh, well, I'm getting ready to go up to see uh, Taz's Hot Dirt, which is one of the projects the 222 Foundation funded up in Toronto. So I'll be doing that coming up pretty quick. And then we're having um, a dedication ceremony coming up pretty quick of the of an orchard here in my hometown. It's a community orchard, the Taz Grackham Orchard. And then we're having a benefit concert. Karen Drucker and Greg Tamblin, we're going to do a benefit concert. So I guess in the next month, it's it's kind of a, some two 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 stuff that I'm going to be working on. But I, at the same time, I will continue every day going to the page and working on this little thing that I mentioned. I've been uh, this has been going through my mind that I I think I want it self published. Can you give us an idea of what what subject it's going to be about? I'm not going to jinx it by saying what it is. I've, like I said, I've got three ideas that have been, but this one is the one that seems to be grabbing my attention. Again, you know, you, you pay a little attention to each of them, right? And you kind of curious. And this one, like I said, has, has kept me going for five days straight where that's the one I want to think about. It. So that's probably going to be it. But so anyway. Yeah. One last question. What are you reading right now? What, am I what does reading? Pam Grout read? You know, I started reading a book today called Lit, and I've only read the um, the introduction, but it seems to be kind of interesting. It's about a guy who um, talks about how our brains, he, I think he might be a brain scientist or something, but our brains can get in what he called what was it, LEB, lazy, energetic brain or something like that, but that we can also be in lit brain. So, you know, there's so many ways to talk about this, like you're connected to you know, the dude or your, you know, in, in the ego, but that's been how he describes it. And I thought that was pretty interesting. I also, um, love reading novels and read, I just, the book I just finished was, do you know Hanif? Oh, is his last name Hanif? I don't read a lot of novels. I would yeah. Like well, he's not stories. a novelist. He writes about sports and he writes about music. Hanif. Oh, interesting. Anyway, but he is like such a beautiful writer. It's almost like you know, watching Simone Biles do her thing, you know, it's like the way he writes is like that. I mean, it's just, you know, you just want to hold your breath. It's so amazing. So I really like reading good writing. I mean, he writes about stuff that I don't write about, you know, music, um, sports, but his writing is so beautiful. He's a poet. And anyway, I heard him speak here in town is how I found out about him. And then, uh, you know, had to get his books and I just finished that book and it was just incredible. So well, what are you reading right now? Maybe you can give me a good tip on what to look for next. Oh my God. What am I reading right now? Um, well, first of all, I don't have any physical books aside from the three you see behind me, which are my own books. But, um, I, so I do, I do a lot of audio books and cause I honestly, I read so many books just for the podcast, but. Oh, I some, bet recreational books kind of get lost in the mix. You know what's interesting, Pam? It's I rarely finish a book that I pick up recreationally these days. I just yeah. haven't. Well, you get so much great content with the people that you're interviewing. I mean, so many things to inspire your mind, your life. I mean, I just think what you do with your podcast is just fabulous. And, you know, it would give you enough fodder for ideas and interest, you know, without reading at all. So I think it's really cool. Do you do it once a week? Is that your? So I've started going twice a week. Uh -huh. uh, I do one new episode and then I do a, what I call a plot twist, which is like the, you know, cause I go into people's backstories on their first interview and I'll, I'll clip that part of the story where they kind of pivot away from the conventional beliefs and they decide to take the leap of faith. So in your case, I haven't done one with you yet, but in your case, it would be, you know, being pregnant and the guy leaves and you're on the road trip and, and like starting the story there instead of like, what would you think about when you were a baby and that kind of thing. But yeah, I, I heard, uh, Stephen Pressfield told me about a book on when he came on my podcast called 
improv wisdom. And so that was the last book I see here that I, I actually downloaded and I started, I think reading the first the introduction, but I haven't, I haven't gone back to it yet. So, but there's nothing better than a book you can't put down. Yeah. And I haven't had that experience in a little while. So I'm looking forward to your next book so that I can, I think probably E squared was one of the last times I, I had that experience. Yeah. I just, I still love that book. I mean, every now and then I'll get it out and look and it's like, wow, this is still really great. We did a 10 year anniversary edition last year that came out with a new, you know, whatever. And that, it was just fun to read it again. And like, wow, this still, this still applies, you know, it, that didn't feel too dated. I mean, some of the references, I do pop culture references, some of those might have gotten dated, but Overall, it was still a great book. I, I'm, I'm proud of that book, actually. So, yeah, thank you. So, okay, if someone wanted to get into the Pam Grout ecosystem, what's the what's what which book would you recommend them starting with? Well, E Squared is you know probably my signature book, the one that you know shot me to fame or whatever. But again, it was my 16th book. I can honestly say I really love all my books. I mean. Half of my books are travel books. You know, I did the three books for National Geographic. I did some other travel books. But I think the things most people want to would want to read about would be maybe my spiritual books. But I really love this uh, Course in Miracles experiment, too. I mean, I think it really holds up. And, you know, I guess it came out in 2020. So here it is, 2024. And there are groups that are still going through it every year. I mean, you know, that still love to go back and read it again. It's just a little bit every day and so I, I it's kind of cool that people have stuck with it in fact it's funny like i said i'm not a marketer but other people have picked up and started little groups online or stuff you know about some of my books and i suppose i could say oh well you can't do that but hey why not i i love it so anyway i mean somebody did a uh, what was it an app about course in miracles experiment you know they just decided to do it so you know, I just kind of sit here and go, thank you, universe, bring it on. You know, I'm just, uh, I'm so lucky. Thank you so much, Pam, for coming back onto the podcast and for indulging me with my personal questions and all my little weird questions and stuff. And um, hopefully one of these days we'll get a chance to cross paths. Yeah, so, well, I do like coming come to, to Mexico, Mexico, so you never know. Yeah. Yeah. How far? You said Guadalajara, right? Is the place I fly into Guadalajara and then it's about a 30 minute drive from there's Lake Chapala. It's the largest lake in Mexico and it's up in the Sierra Madre. So it's beautiful climate. Well, Mexico City's a good climate too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, when you said it was raining, I thought, yeah, that's probably because, you know, in Ayahik, it cools off, the rain comes, and then the winters, I mean, the summers are just ideal. They're perfect because there's yeah. that lot of the rain that happens. It's the rainy season. But it just is wonderful. So. You definitely let me know the next time you come. I don't know if I'll be in Kansas anytime soon, but. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, <laughs> well, no. place most people come. Although only now and then I'll get somebody that'll email me. Hey, I'm driving through Kansas. If you want to go get a coffee and I'm around, sometimes I'll do it. So you never know. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you in Mexico. I'll, I'll do that. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again. And, uh, and uh, we'll see you hopefully soon. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Light. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.